Hey guys, so today I want to talk to you about a big problem with cryptocurrency. As you know, there's a big problem when it comes to finding a convenient, reliable wallet or platform. I mean, there's thousands of them out there, so how do you even make a decision? It kind of makes your brain hurt. Well, today I got you a pretty cool interview with a guy named Brett Musser. Brett is with Edge, and Edge is a multi-asset blockchain platform for storing and trading crypto. Yeah. That simple. So how about we learn from him and he can tell us where to invest our money and how to safely store it. I'm just gonna jump right into it and ask you about Edge. Uh, you guys are not just a crypto wallet. Uh, can you maybe tell us a bit about yourself and what you offer to customers? Yeah, sure. So we're a crypto wallet that's how uh, I guess retail and users know us and we're also a security platform. So that's how a lot of projects or companies, uh, you know, maybe some apps out there that leverage some of the tools that we have we use to build our crypto wallet and be kind of sliced up and licensed out. But most users know us as uh, a crypto wallet. And within the crypto wallet, you can, like any basic wallet, you can receive, send, store, uh, but we also offer exchange services. And we don't, we, we're not actually you know, facilitating the exchange. We're kind of connecting you to exchanges. So we have crypto to fiat exchanges. And we also have crypto to crypto exchanges within the wallet. Uh, we kind of co connect users to it and try to make it as user friendly as possible. And our focus is really on security and usability uh, of these of these new networks and financial assets. Security and usability, yeah, that actually sounds great. Uh, I've been going to a lot of conventions over the last year, and we've been when you go to like the booth kiosk area, there's a lot of companies that are crypto wallets that are brand new. It seems like there's hundreds coming out every few yeah. months, and every time I approach one of them, like, hey, what? Can you summarize yourself? Because they always want to give you like a really big pitch. I'm like, just what are you? Tell me what you are. Yeah. People seem to really struggle with that and find a way to stand out. It's definitely a saturated space. We we've, we've seen people come and go over the years. You know, we've been doing it for five years now. And uh, I guess something that differentiates us from all the other wallets, from a, a security perspective and ease of use perspective, is the way we handle backups and our account system. So we're focused on uh, users that have a phone and want to store or use cryptocurrency and they want to have control. Of it. So what a lot of wallets do, and it's pretty standard, they they have you know 12 or 24 word seeds that they have their users back up, you know, write it down and back up, and that serves as the backup for their wallet. Well, we reserve that that possibility for our users. Every user can can write down their 12 or 24 word seed if they want to, but we also have an account creation process which is we use a username and password. Now, Edge never sees that username and password. It's it's done on the phone itself, and we use that as the encryption key for your account. And we encrypt it right on the phone, even before it hits the disk on your phone. So uh, we don't have the key, no one else has the key unless you, you tell them. And uh, I want to talk about uh, the uh, CoinGecko's annual report. I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but it's in 2018, lot. they said that hackers managed to steal 867 million from exchanges and wallets. Now yeah. that's 50% more than the previous years. Uh, why do you think hackers are becoming so much more active? Is it that the actual crypto services are not really paying sufficient attention to security? Or is it just because you know it's another year in crypto, so there's more hackers and it's just gonna happen? Maybe a yes. combination. But I would just say, you know, uh, 2017 was a frenzy and people see that uh, people are interested in these assets and whenever the value of something goes up, uh, you know, criminals, especially high, I'd say, I don't know if they're called high value criminals, but, uh, you know, sophisticated criminals, you know, they're rational economic actors. When they see money flowing into a certain certain area, they're going to go try to, you know, poke it out, uh, poke around. Uh, and then with exchanges in particular, I mean, I, I don't, I, it's like I want to be in that business, but I also don't want to be in that business because exchanges make a lot of money. But it is, it's it's tough, and I'd say a huge risk. Just like just like from if anyone's worked in retail, most of the retail stealing is in, kind of an inside job. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised that a lot of the stuff you know has at least they get some tips from insiders. You know, kind of touching back on that point of report, they said that when it came to market cap, cryptocurrency fell by seventy eight percent, and coins losing between seventy to ninety percent of their value. When it comes to a big market crash like that, how does that affect how does that industry affect your business in particular? So the run-up definitely, we definitely saw that wave in the last in the last quarter of 2017, and we saw our usage and download statistics kind of skyrocket. 
Now, in terms of revenue and like the you know raw you know you know uh, income sheet kind of statistics, right? Uh, we didn't. We saw a big ramp up, but not as not as big as like just the usage and new users and the the subsequent drawdown uh, didn't necessarily affect our business in a negative way. I, I think it uh, speaks to the robustness of our team and our you know our business model. Uh, things going up, you know, do we do pretty well, and then things going down, we're still doing pretty well. Uh, you know, we haven't had to lay off anyone. You know, we try to hire slow and fire slow if, if if that happens, but we haven't had to really, you know, there was really no negative consequences on our end. It de- we definitely saw a huge drawdown in like the new accounts, you know, because during the run up, everyone's just like, I got to get in, download this thing. And then, you know, maybe they lost it, you know, they bought for a little bit, lost interest, sold, and then got out and deleted the app. Or, and I'm sure that happened with a lot of other services, but uh, we handled it pretty well. Our QA and support were definitely up, you know, definitely more tickets, people asking. Uh, and then it kind of petered off, uh, I guess, throughout 2018. You mentioned waves, but would you consider that what just happened, the bursting of a bubble? Yeah, I'd say it's even, it was a frenzy, a theming frenzy, uh, just, you know, kind of pure greed and speculation, uh, which I think it oftentimes gets a bad rap, but I think it's it's absolutely needed. Some of, I mean, what we do as humans is speculate on things, yeah. right? We speculate, you know, before they happen. It's more, I guess that's a key advantage for people to be able to uh, speculate on you know, how things are going to turn out and put, put money on the table. Uh, and you also had, uh, it, it was hard for people to differentiate between crypto assets or cryptocurrencies. You know, they basically just get all lumped into one big thing, and uh, which is understandable when people are new to something. You know, they it's treated as a general category and then they think like diversification is the way to go. Uh, that's not always the case. Uh, there's a lot of junk in crypto and uh, these things are still experiments. It's hard for people to really, they don't even know really what Bitcoin is and the community itself is still divided on what exactly it is. So you just got a lot, a lot of hot money coming in and people have to remember that, uh, you know, prices are just temporary agreements at a certain period of time between buyers and sellers and usually on some type of big exchange. So it's not a, a price, even though it's a number, it's not a scientific fact. Right? It's just something that we all agree on happening. But these facts, these prices are very loose and always changing. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's 2019 right now and we're still, it, it, it still feels so bearish and sluggish in the market. What do you think the prospects are for the crypto market going forward in this year? Uh, some people are saying this entire year is just gonna be you know, just as slow and maybe we're gonna dip significantly. Uh, some people are kind of optimistic, but uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, so long term, I'm a permanent bull. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a younger guy and I'm, you know, I, I'm in this for the long term. And so I'm always, and I get, I've been getting paid in Bitcoin for three years. So I'm always, I'm always kind of on the, in the market and, you know, collecting Satoshis over time. That's the game I'm playing. Uh, short term, I'm, I'm a perma, I have no idea, <laughs> right? Like it, it's, it's going to move. Uh, it's going to move violently. I can I can predict the volatility, uh, and I, so my I'm not my gut able... intuition would be it would move sideways to down. So it kind of sounds like I'm not going to get a nice big bold prediction for year end Bitcoin for you that we could use as clickbait. Oh uh, man, you want a clickbait one? Uh, <laughs> Give us your go. 2019 year end prediction. I'll go. I'll I'll be a little bullish. So I can be a little positive. We'll go okay. five thousand. Um, on to a much less sexy topic. Uh, let's talk about. Oh, and I have no data to back that up. Whatsoever. No data. No, it's very. No data. You it's said, just what I feel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it seems like everyone that was making predictions a few years ago, this time around, when we were doing all these interviews, they're like, no, no, I don't want to go on record with anything. Yeah, yeah. No one has any idea. No one does because it's there's no agreed upon fundamentals, and the the market is so small. Uh, you know, small players can still make pretty big, or well, they would be big in the in the ecosystem we're talking about, but it doesn't take a lot of money to move the markets uh, pretty quickly. And there's no consensus on what the actual fundamentals are. Uh, yeah, so it's just, it's hard to price. So like like people get caught up and they see numbers, you know, don't, don't read too much into the numbers, right? It's just what people are agreeing to buy and sell. 
uh, at that particular time. As I was saying earlier, I want to get away from the sexy topic of pricing predictions and everything and get onto regulation. So uh, regarding that, authorities increasingly started demanding exchanges and crypto services conduct KYC, AML verifications, whereas Edge almost doesn't require any data to create an account. Uh, no. Is there a reason for that kind of policy? Well, yeah, first of all, it's a value bar. So we think there's been a sick inversion on a lot of the, our systems, either financial or uh, communication systems where, uh, you know, Silicon Valley has basically built their, their whole business model on collecting data and selling it. And then Wall Street, they collect everyone's money and loan it out, right? And they either make money on it or they get bailed out by the federal government, right? Uh, so we, we want to take the opposite approach of not collecting money and selling it out or loaning it out and not collecting data and selling it out. So we're kind of anti-Wall Street, anti-Silicon Valley uh, on, on that front. And we think privacy is uh, kind of a fundamental human right, uh, kind of in the natural state of things. And in general, when it comes to the authorities and interfering with the crypto market itself, do you think the market should be able to regulate itself? Or do you think there needs to be a bit more you know, authoritative influence than there is right now? Currently? So I. I personally, you know, I, I, I tend to lean libertarian, but I'm, I'm definitely not like, uh, you know, destroy all regulations. I guess I'm a little more moderate in that sense. But, but the governments, if they want to regulate something, should regulate, you know, businesses that are doing certain things on top of those networks, right? So they might have uh, an exchange business might still has to comply with labor laws, you know, um, or, you know, maybe they have a corporation set up, they need to set up, they need to uh, abide by certain accounting standards, right? All that stuff is fair game. I have no problem with that. Do they need to regulate Bitcoin or Ethereum? No. And if they do, I think those networks have failed miserably. I'd say regulators are in the role much bigger issues in their own financial markets, the traditional ones, than anything going on in crypto. Like that's just such a, a yeah, it's so out of mind for them. You know, they, they got their own financial system to kind of regulate and was out of control in its own way and not in a good way. Ours is out of control and self-regulating. It seems like there's still a lot of reason for excitement. Uh, a lot of people I've spoken to seem to think that while the prices may stay depressed this year and it may stay as bearish as ever, this is going to be a tremendous year of growth for the industry. And yeah, so great. you have a few, a few things coming up. You have Fidelity launching their, uh, their service, so I guess they'll be exposing their customers to some type of crypto asset product. I'm not exactly sure what's happening there. You have the uh, company backed that's coming out. Uh, then you have, I think, TD and Airtrade is working with their own, uh, their team on that, some type of crypto product. I know ATMs are just booming in terms of, you know, ATM operators putting up ATMs all around the world. Uh, you know, we get inquiries all around the world, users all around the world asking for help. I don't know if there's any other headwinds, but you know, I mean, I see a lot of custodial solutions getting built, so the on-ramps with big money to come in are there. I, I wouldn't bank on that, but it's uh, it's good to have a bridge there for uh, an option, you know, for uh, big buyers to come in. So, you know, I, like I said before, I'm always a permable uh, long-term. You know, uh, like I said, I'm young, uh, you know, in a decade, none of this will really matter. You know, it'll, it'll shoot way past this uh, current bear cycle. Uh, but right now, I'd expect, I'd expect sideways, status quo, uh, you know, nothing too big or small to happen. Great. Awesome. And on that positive note, Brett, I just want to thank you for your time. That was really, that was really nice. I really hope oh, viewers learned a thing or two about you guys and what you do, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk again soon. Yeah, if users want to check us out at edge.app. That's our website, edge.app. And you can go on there, check us out, see what our whole story is about, and also download us on iOS or Android. Thanks a lot, Brett. Thank you. Speak soon. Hi, right, guys. Well, I really hope that interview shed some insights on what kind of crypto wallets are out there and what kind of investments you could be looking forward to making in the coming year. In the meantime, thank you, Brett, so much for doing this interview. If you have any questions for us, please leave them below in comments. And as usual, like, comment, subscribe. Thank you guys for watching. Nakamoto Jedi.